Hello everybody, good morning, happy 1st of July. I can't quite believe it is the second half of 2021 already. Where has the first half gone? Um, my name is David Kelly. I'm the Executive Director of the British Chamber of Commerce here in Singapore and a very warm welcome to today's webinar, a UK outlook, essential tax planning, for UK inheritance tax and domicile. A huge thank you to our event partners, Select Investors, for supporting this important topic today and for um, Select Investors' continued support of the Chamber. It's uh, hugely appreciated. And most people do not realise that UK inheritance tax extends to the global estates of most British expatriates, um, even if they have been away from the UK for many years. And this is particularly pertinent as well, um, as today the Chamber launched our half-year business sentiment survey which indicates a shift in manpower and those deciding to leave and move to Singapore. So a very important topic that we're covering today. Today, we are joined by Martin Rimmer, Head of Tax for Select Investors, who will share how this can be planned for effectively and in ways which um, you can reduce income and capital gains tax as well. Following Martin's presentation, we'll have an open discussion uh, in a virtual session where you can raise your virtual hand and voice your questions directly to Martin. Um, alternatively, you can also post questions into the chat box function as well, and you can anonymise your questions if there are any sensitivities around the questions that you might want to ask. So before we get the session all kicked off and before I hand over to Martin, we're just going to run a very quick poll um, and ask you which of the following are the most important areas for you. So. Um, we've got a couple of options there, keeping my inheritance tax exposures and as low as possible, um, keeping fully in control of my assets, making sure that my next of kin are properly able to manage the wealth that they will inherit, and keeping my planning as simple as possible. So I'll just give it a couple of seconds just to get your input. Great stuff. How's the poll looking, Helen? Good, I'll just give it a couple more seconds. We've got a few more people to vote and then you should see them appearing now. Superb. Okay, so uh, top of the list, keep in mind inheritance tax exposures and as low as possible. Um, and then sort of a fairly even spread around uh, keeping fully in control of my assets, keeping my planning as simple as possible. And a slight increase in making sure that my next of kin are probably able to manage their wealth as well. Really interesting. Thank you for that. That helps us to shape the conversation um, going forwards. And um, so without further ado, um, I would like to hand over to Martin to begin his presentation. Martin, it's brilliant to have you uh, back with us today. Um, thanks so much for your time. and really looking forward to your presentation again and look forward to um, um, talking to you afterwards. Thanks, Martin. Great pleasure. Thanks ever so much indeed, David, and, and welcome to everybody. Um, it's a lovely day, isn't it? And as you said, David, I can't quite believe we're in July. We're in the second half of the year already. Where has that time gone? So, um, so welcome, everybody. And today I'm just probably spend about 35, 40 minutes talking through really four main areas. So I think I've got three slides on how inheritance tax works. Very important that we get to a common sense of understanding. And then I'm going to illustrate that with three worked examples that just show you the horror of the system. There's one slide on how we should approach inheritance tax planning. And then the remaining part of the presentation will be actually drilling into some of the main solutions. Um, so before I get going, I just wanted to say just very briefly a few words about select investors. We're actually part of the St. James's Place um, Wealth Management Group. And there's our team as it stood um, that must have been about 18 months ago now. We've got about 20 people with us now. Um, so you know, two, two UK tax advisors, an Aussie tax advisor, a um, bunch of financial advisors, will writers, Singapore tax advisors. So we were a very multi-competent team. Um, based here, of course, in Singapore. And we specialise in doing three things, and we put them together in a very, very unique way. So obviously we manage money for people, um, and we firmly believe that, that wealth management cannot be divorced from tax planning. And in this case, with inheritance tax, succession planning as well, these things are intrinsic to each other and can't really be done well apart from each other. So what we seek to do is put our clients right in the very centre. We start where the client wants to. So if you just want to talk to me about tax, that's fine. I'll give you as much tax advice as you want. Here we can find solutions that allow us to blend some good succession planning and wealth wealth planning into those um, in, you know, together. Then obviously we'd look to, to talk to you more about that. Um, so 
there is obviously a call to action from today. I would be absolutely delighted to, to meet or speak with, with any of you on a one-on-one -on -one basis in an exploratory manner without any, any charge or obligation. We're, we're very passionate about what we do. Um, it sounds a bit, bit um, what's the word? Um, we believe that we can change lives and change futures by the way in which we, we help clients to manage their money. Um, and that's really what we're passionate about, actually. It's, it's, it's helping people to achieve the goals and their dreams um, you know, in retirement and on the way to retirement. So as a follow up, the British Chamber very kindly said that they will distribute um, a link to this presentation together with my contact details um, and just an overview of some of the other webinars that we've got, we've got going. So thank you very much to the British Chamber for, for agreeing to do that. Just before I get into the tax, obviously, um, you know, there has to be a caveat on everything. Everything you're about to hear today is correct as at the point of time. And now, you know, you, you can definitely go and Google all of this stuff online. But the art of providing tax advice or wealth advice or succession advice is taking the knowledge that we have and applying it to you in a very bespoke and value laden way. So uh, whilst everything I'm going to be saying today is true, you, you have to expect, expect that. Um, don't take it as a recommendation for action. We, we need to understand you before we can be sure uh, about the correctness of the recommendations that, that we make. So all of that aside, let's dive straight into the tax, shall we? So first question, what is inheritance tax? Well, it's a tax that applies when wealth leaves your estate. Um, and that can typically happen in a number of ways. You can make a gift during your lifetime. You make gifts during your um, upon your death through your wills. Um, maybe you sell an asset at undervalue. We're not talking about um, wealth leaving your estate through through a loss in value of assets. That's just that's just economics, um, and it can also apply on the transfer of assets into a trust. So actually, quite a few circumstances in which we need to think about inheritance tax. And would you believe it? There are actually nine categories of tax rates, um, and there they are. So you can see in the middle, we have to differentiate between gifts made in your lifetime. So I decided to give my son £100,000 in my life um, and gifts upon death, which is where inheritance tax typically um, hits you at, at the full force. But it depends very much on whether, whether those gifts are being made to exempt persons. In other words, no inheritance tax at all. And we'll talk about that in a moment to individuals with beating hearts, private individuals or animals. Would you believe you can actually give money to animals? Um, but anyway, you just need if you're given your life, you just need to survive by seven years. If it's a gift upon death, um, then it's taxed at 40 percent. And if you make transfers into trusts, um, during your life, there's a 20% charge. And if you die within seven years, there's another 20% charge, so on and so forth. So um, quite a lot to this. Um, so what I'd now like to do is just break it down and make it a little bit simpler and say, I'll start with the allowances, talk about um, the breadth of inheritance tax and what exempt persons are, because that's also important. So um, when we give things away during our lifetime, you can actually give £3,000 away per year without even having to think about inheritance tax. It's not um, a tax on Christmas or birthdays, basically, unless you're super generous. Um, so £3,000 a year without having to think. If you go above that, you can also transfer up to £325,000 free of inheritance tax to anyone, a person, a trust, whatever you like. If you give away uh, an interest or upon your death, to a child, um, an interest in a current or former main residence, you also get an additional main residence nil rate right band. It's actually 175,000 um, pounds at the moment. And then there is a specific additional allowance if you, as if me, as a British domicile person, give assets to a non-British domiciled spouse. That's another 325. Well, and, and we'll be illustrating those allowances in, in just one moment. So the question then is, well, how broadly does inheritance tax apply? Now, we're all, I think, probably fairly familiar with the concept of tax residence. We're all resident in Singapore. We're not resident in the UK for tax purposes. And as, as far as it goes, that drives our exposure or lack of it to income and capital gains tax. But for inheritance tax, we have a wholly different concept called domicile. And in essence, Domicile is where you consider your permanent home to be. 
Um, so I was born, bred and raised in the UK. My father, my parents were married when I was born, uh, and therefore I take my domicile from my dad, and he was domiciled in England and Wales at the date of my birth. That's my domicile of origin. Um, and that means even though I've been here in Singapore for 10 years, I haven't made the decision in a resolute way that Singapore will be my permanent home. It's my current centre of gravity, but not my permanent centre of gravity. Therefore, I'm still domiciled in the UK, which means that I'm exposed to tax if I pass away on my worldwide assets. If you happen to be not domiciled in the UK, either because you're not of British descent or perhaps because you have made the decision that Singapore or perhaps somewhere else will be your permanent home, then your non-UK assets are exempt from tax. So migrating from a domicile in the UK to a domicile outside of the UK can be a tremendously lucrative thing from a tax planning perspective, and we will be talking about that later. So the last slide on principles, um, I just wanted to mention something about gifts in your lifetime. Um, if I decided to give £100,000 to my son, um, that is an effective gift for inheritance tax purposes only if I never benefit from that asset again. All right. Um, so you have to give in, in a way that it means it's truly gone. You can't benefit from it or control it or enjoy it, okay? Um, if you make a gift and you, you've done this in that way and then say 10 years later, you decide to say it's a property, you give the property away and then 10 years later you move into it. Well, that falls right back into your estate because you've taken that reservation up again. So when we talk about giving throughout this presentation, it's giving in, in a final um, way so that it really is gone. Key exemptions. If you decide, funnily enough, they would write this into the law to give your to give your assets to UK political parties. It is completely free of inheritance tax. And, uh, and that's why uh, Mr. Johnson is smiling. And that would be the case, wouldn't it? Secondly, if you decide to give your assets to charities registered in the European Economic Area and the UK, then that's also free of tax. So there's a, a little baby guide dog so um, there always has to be at least one fluffy animal in um, in any of my presentations and I'll leave you to decide which of those creatures is the fluffy animal. Um, finally spouses this is really important transfers between spouses in life and on death are exempt from inheritance tax in all situations except one and I think I've got a there we go right so basically if both spouses are domiciled in the UK and you make a gift between them of any amount at any point in life or death, free of inheritance tax. If both spouses are not UK domiciled, also free of inheritance tax. If the non-UK domiciled spouse, so Singaporean spouse, for example, gives assets to a UK domiciled spouse in life or death, that's also free of inheritance tax, but not the other way around. So if I as a British domicile person, give assets to a non-British spouse, um, well, I have to survive that gift in life by seven years, and if I do it on death, it's taxable, for which there is an additional allowance of £325,000. So quite a lot of theory there. Let's now drill it down with some examples, which I hope will, 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 will get us to a common understanding. So we've got Lewis, a British domicile, who makes a gift of half a million pounds to his sister. June 2018 and then passes away in September 23, leaving an estate worth 1.5 million. So Lewis was alive when he made this gift and it was a gift to a private individual. So there's no tax at that point. The only requirement is that he is given in a way that it's gone and he survives for seven years. Well, so there's no tax at the point of the gift, but he didn't survive for seven years. So we have to assess the value of that gift to inheritance tax um, at the point of his death, which is September 2023. So and that's how we do it. We've got £500,000. We can knock off a couple of annual exemptions in this case and his nil rate band, leaving um, £169,000 worth of that gift in charge. Lewis did manage to survive after the fifth anniversary, so he's an, uh, allowed to enjoy what's known as taper relief, which takes 60% of the tax away, which leaves his sister with a cheque to write at £27,040. And that has to be paid within six months of the, uh, of the date of, um, of Lewis's death. But that isn't all, because he's also left an estate 
worth 1.5 million pounds. So let's see how that's taxed. So 1.5 million pounds, his allowance has been fully used against the gift that he made to his sister. So the, the full amount of this, um, of this estate is subject to tax at 40%, which is horrendous. Uh, again, 40% rate. So total tax as a consequence of his death, 627,040 pounds, an effective rate of 31%. Now this assumes no planning has been done. It is a horrendous outcome. Um, so obviously we need to plan. Um, so, you know, the purpose of these illustrations is just to show you the full force of the awfulness of the system. So next example, um, Victor and Margaret, where are they? There they are. Do you remember them? If anyone's from the UK, you'll remember Victor and Margaret Meldrew. So they're domiciled in the UK. Uh, they might, let's just assume they're living in Singapore for, for, for the sake of argument. They've got two kids. Victor passes away um, and all assets transfer to, to Margaret. She then passes away and everything goes to the kids. Standard planning. And these are their assets. So they've got the main home, although in the UK, but they've, they've got the main home in the UK worth £750,000 owned jointly, an investment property that Victor owns, um, St James's Place International Investment Account, uh, how convenient, uh, that Margaret owns worth a million pounds, some money in the bank and some shares, ISAs and premium bonds. So how does the tax work in this situation? Well, first of all, Victor passes away and everything goes to Margaret. Um, that is a transfer between like domiciled spouses, so it's exempt. So Margaret gets everything without inheritance tax. She still needs to apply for probate um, and um, Victor's unused inheritance tax allowance passes to Margaret. Margaret then passes away. It's a fully taxable transfer because it goes to the children, not to a surviving spouse. So total marital estate of 3.6 million, two lots of allowances and then tax of 40 percent, which is still very, very horrendous. As I say, there's a lot of planning we can do in this situation, but effectively almost 33 percent of tax. And then the third example, um, let's, uh, Terry and June. I, I didn't get a picture of Terry and June, but if you, you might remember them as well, sort of 1970s sitcom. Um, so Terry is domiciled in the UK, married to June, who's domiciled in Singapore. Same situation, two adult children. He goes first, everything goes to her. She passes away, everything goes to the children. And to make things simple, I've left the assets exactly the same. But the point to make is that the international investment bond that June owns is situated outside of the UK. And that's important because June is not domiciled in the UK and is not liable to inheritance tax on non-UK assets. So how does the tax work in this situation? So Terry passes away and everything goes to June. That's a transfer from a British domiciled spouse to a non-British domiciled spouse. So um, we have to tax it. And there are a couple of allowances available. So this is Terry's um, half share of Terry's estate. He gets his standard nil rate band, but he also gets this additional allowance to cater for this particular situation. Uh, so what's left is taxed at uh, 40 percent. So tax of 330 thousand pounds payable at the, by the end of the sixth month following Terry's death and that obviously would probably be funded from the cash. So June has acquired all of the assets. Um, she then passes away. So we've got the main home, uh, the investment property has become hers, the Irish international investment account is exempt because it's outside the UK in the hands of June who's domiciled in Singapore. The cash deposit's been reduced by the tax that was paid previously and we've got the other shares there. She has uh, a nil rate band of £325,000 and tax is due on everything apart from that. So net estate of 1.4, nearly 1.5, an effective rate of tax of 34%. So when you put these two things together, um, total tax paid is just a little bit more than £1.1 million. Pounds. It's an effective rate of nearly 31%. Um, and again, that has to be paid within six months um, of you know, the six months following the month of her, of her death. <clears throat> so these examples were deliberate in so far as they've incorporated no planning. Uh, it's important you come face to face with just how awful it can be in order that we can then take a proper approach to planning for it. Um, so I've been as bold in my past to describe inheritance tax as a voluntary tax. 
maybe that was just a little bit too feisty, but there is a lot that you can do. Um, so we're going to spend the rest of our time just talking through some of those solutions. But before doing so, I just wanted to put um, how we plan for inheritance tax into some context for you. So I, mean, I think um, we have to understand where you are at in your life. Is it appropriate to do inheritance tax planning in your 30s and 40s? Well, if you're wealthy enough, yes. Uh, and certainly you should always plan for the unexpected. But most inheritance tax planning solutions involve um, a, a change of control of assets, a change of location of assets, setting up structures that, that provide particular inheritance tax solutions. Now, that might not be appropriate for people who are still building their wealth. So we need to understand where are you in your personal journey? What are you trying to do with your wealth? Um, how philanthropic are you? Um, obviously, we, we want our wealth to produce income for retirement, um, to do so in a way that, that leaves us with you know, financial security and not, and not worrying about it all the time. So I think the best inheritance tax solutions are ones that combine uh, income and capital gains tax efficiency with inheritance tax efficiency. And that's where select investors is really good. We, 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 we can do a lot of that. Um, how important to you is it to create... Um, legacies. Well, obviously, it's important to pass on wealth, um, but maybe you want to spend it all. We need to understand that as your advisors to ensure that the solutions we come up are pragmatic um, and achieve what you really want them to do. Uh, and it's a slightly related point, but it, it isn't just about passing wealth on. It's also about passing values and ethics on as well. If you've worked really hard for this money and preserve it, you want to ensure that those who will be receiving it um, obviously enjoy it, but don't really, but hopefully reflect some of the values and are capable of managing money in a, in a, in a prudent and sensible way. If, if, if a, a hallmark of your life has been philanthropy, it may be very important for you um, in the context of your own succession and legacy planning to ensure that, that some philanthropy is built in. So, you know, that's important. I'd also say, um, yeah, and to be brutally honest, all inheritance tax planning involves some kinds of costs, whether that's financial, um, some structures cost money to set up and run. Sometimes you have to surrender control and influence, and sometimes you have to lose the wealth. For example, if you decide to give, give assets away. So proper understanding and balancing of the cons with the pros is really, really important. So one of the things that we're very keen to do is, is to present both sides of the both sides of every recommendation. There are no silver bullets. Um, there are no costless um, transactions. Costless tax planning doesn't exist, really. Um, but it's a question of setting everything into its proper context to ensure that overall aims are met. Um, I said before, don't start too early. I also don't want you to leave it late. There is no such thing as deathbed planning with inheritance tax. So it's important to start when you feel ready, but you know, we typically would suggest that we look at it in earnest within a few years of retirement. The earlier we sort the problem out, the compounding effect of the tax saved is obviously on your side. The longer we leave it, the inheritance tax problem grows. I typically recommend you to focus your planning on one or perhaps two main pillars. Uh, we'll be talking about some of those in a moment. Um, but also have a second, a backup plan. So it's very common for people to really go help for leather it's a domicile argument. But unless you've done something else to protect you, the domicile argument ultimately doesn't work. You're back to square one. So I think we should always have first level planning options and second level planning options. So enough waffle about context. Let's just get into some of the solutions. So here, here they are. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk you through all of these and I'll, I'll do so at varying speeds. So first of all, gifting as, as a strategy. If you are wealthy enough to afford to give away money, um, it's a perfectly feasible thing to do. Obviously, you're losing the wealth um, and you should give it away without reservation of benefit. Now, in other words, give it away so that it's truly gone. Um, obviously, when it's gone, you can't have it back. So you have to be sure that you can bear the loss of the capital. Very common for people to be a bit concerned about passing wealth directly to kids. Uh, and for that situation, trusts can, can be quite useful. And we'll, we'll be talking about trusts in, in a moment. 
I think really four types of gifts. So just give money away. OK, no tax if you survive for seven years, reduces your estate for inheritance tax purposes. You can't have it back. But if you die within seven years, some inheritance tax might be due. You can actually insure yourself against death within seven years. And it's a very limited period, so it's, it's very cheap. You can also give away excess income. So if, if we work out how much income I'm getting from all sources and how much am I spending, if there's a surplus left over on a monthly basis or a regular basis, you can give that away either directly to, to, to next of kin or into a trust for their benefit with no inheritance tax consequences whatsoever. Um, so gifts out of excess income is a very, very important carve out. Um, so you're, you're, what, what you're doing is you're preventing that excess income from forming part of your capital, which contributes to the inheritance tax problem. You're hiving it off into a trust or directly to, to you know, pay school fees, for example, um, for grandchildren. You, you, you're hiving it away without a need to survive for seven years. Um, and and you know, ideally into a trust, because then you can control the investment and the distribution charity. Um, uh, distribution policy. Now, charitable donations in life and on death are completely free of tax. Um, they need to be to UK or EEA registered charities, so not Singapore charities, sadly. Um, but, you know, uh, it, it's not uncommon to see clients want to do that, but of course the money bypasses family. Um, if you do decide to give at least 10% of your net estate, so net estate after costs and, and debt deductions, a way to a charity, what they'll allow you to do is to reduce your inheritance tax from 40% to 36 on what remains. Um, I don't see many people doing that. Actually, 10% is quite a lot. But um, so, so gifting certainly is a very popular way of doing things. It doesn't really come with any financial costs. OK, so it's not like you're buying a product. You don't have to worry about how the assets are invested unless they're going into a trust. Um, so, so certainly we would always want clients to, to consider their own um, attitude towards gifting, their own propensity to gift, um, can often be an important part of the strategy. Um, secondly, uh, not gifting as a strategy, this is actually should be called life assurance written in trust. I don't know why that, that title didn't change, but in essence, let's just say, I'll, I'll illustrate myself, let's just assume for a moment that I'm carrying an inheritance tax exposure of a million pounds at the moment. I'm not dead yet, thankfully, um, but if I were to die, there would be inheritance tax due of a million quid. What I can do is choose to, to, to take some additional life cover that pays a million pounds out if I were to die within a specific term. Um, but to prevent that million pounds that, that materializes on my death becoming part of the that my estate and thus part of the problem, I have that in uh, that that life assurance um, a contract written within a trust over which my family can benefit, and that protects it from inheritance tax. Um, so you set a period. So for me, it might be up to retirement, or maybe you're going to give away a substantial asset, and you've got to survive seven years. It's a seven-year policy. Um, I'd always encourage you to think about. Two, uh, two things, death in quick succession, if there are two of you, or a common accident. That's your risk, uh, assuming that assets can pass between you free of tax on the first death. Uh, and then to consider whether your financial resources are sufficient to bear the cost of that inheritance tax in terms of what you might want to leave um, for children if you have them. Um, Obviously, if you survive the term, the thing has had no value, but it has given you peace of mind. Um, and the, you know, the, the other thing I'd say about this, it doesn't actually take the inheritance tax away. It's just a just a, an inheritance tax free way of funding it. So um, so life assurance written in trust, a very, very good solution, by the way, whilst you're creating wealth. Um, the younger you are, the cheaper it is, the longer the period can be. Um, so I've just taken out a policy for two million pounds. Um, and um, because I'm a bit fat, they, they actually added on uh, what they call, they loaded it slightly. So, so they gave me a quote and then they added something to it. And that's a 15 year policy and that's costing me 350 pounds a month, really cheap. For the peace of mind, it's so much worth it. And that obviously goes into a trust. Right, so next one, um, migration to a domicile of choice. Now, one of the, the titles of this, this uh, webinar is, um, included the word domicile. So I just wanted to focus on this. It's a very common 
um, aspiration of people to move from a UK domicile of origin to a domicile of choice. I've said Singapore, but it could be anywhere. Um, so your lifelong default position, if you were born, bred and raised in the UK, a British parent is UK domicile, which is worldwide assets. But if you're successful in achieving a domicile of choice by the time you die somewhere else, then it's just your UK assets that are liable, which moves all the non-UK assets out of your estate, saving 40% of tax, 40% tax on their value. So really important. What do you need to do? Um, well, we have no statute law on this. So in other words, no one sat down and designed law uh, and said, these are the conditions you must meet. It's only case law. Uh, and we've got about 250 years worth of case law on this. Um, so I'll be talking a little bit about some of those principles in a moment. But in essence, the conditions really boil down to two main ones. Firstly, and they are in this order, you've got to have the right intentions. The first intentions, I'm going to illustrate it with Singapore. You have to be resolute and sure, uh, as far as you can be sure of anything, that your permanent centre of gravity and permanent home will be Singapore to the exclusion of every other place in the world. In other words, I cast my lot in with Singapore completely and I wish to be here for the rest of my life. And you have to hold that intention sincerely. And you have to hold the inverse intention with the UK. Yes, I have connections to the UK. I might have family there, I was born there. I might even be affectionate for the UK, but I am never going to live there again. Um, uh, I have no intention of doing so. I, I'm abandoning the UK as a home and a homeland. So it's a big deal. The, 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 the bar is set quite high. Um, obviously, the revenue, um, despite what they might think, are not thought police. Um, so, you know, um, you, you tell us what you think and then we'll help you build the case. But obviously, we'd always, we'd always encourage you to build it or to have those intentions sincerely held. Secondly, so if, if you like, if that's talking the talk, how do you walk the walk? How do we validate your intentions by what you do, your actions? So have you organized all important parts of your life around Singapore? And have you cut as far as you can ties to the UK that you can reasonably cut? And you know, if you've done both of those things, then we would say you have a domicile of choice in Singapore and it's very important to get that properly documented, get your wills written up in accordance with that. But I want to drill a little bit deeper. Um, so with domicile, with a change of domicile, um, if it ever goes to court, you know, what, what's the burden of proof? Well, the burden of proof is balance of probabilities. What does that mean? It means that, 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 that those who are deciding need to be 51% sure. Uh, so it's not beyond reasonable doubt, which is the criminal test. This is um, just balance of probabilities. Now, I don't want anyone to be doing their domicile planning on the basis of 51% certainty. I want my clients to be 80, 90% sure. Um, now, a domicile, in fact, to be effective, you wouldn't want to rest your entire inheritance tax planning strategy on something where we're not really that sure. So we need to be sure. Um, when you change your domicile, it must be rooted at a point in time. So we have to do some work together to understand when your intentions changed. Um, nationality is not the same as domicile. OK, so uh, Mohammed Al Fayed, the former owner of Harrods, wanted to become domiciled in the UK. Um, he even became a British citizen, but that did not prevent um, the courts from taking the view that he had not taken British domicile. He wanted that so that he could get loads of legal cases decided under UK law, because your, your domicile drives where you, you, the relationship with a particular system of law. Um, it attaches by legal system, not by country. What does that mean? So in the UK, we've got three legal systems, England and Wales, Northern Ireland and Scotland. Australia's got seven, the US has got 50, Switzerland has got a bunch as well, 13 cantons. We do it on, 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 um, on the basis of systems of law. Um, so, yeah. Now, to be domiciled in a, in a take a domicile of choice in another country, you have to be an inhabitant of that country, which is different from being a tax resident. So it's possible to be not tax resident of the country, but to be an inhabitant. So I just wanted to make the distinction. So as we dig into the case law now, I'm going to just on, on one slide for each point. What factors do we have to take into account? What is the real interplay between intention, which is super important, and action that validates intention? What evidence do we need to supply? And what happens if you change your mind? Um, because 
like dust flow curveballs. So what factors do we take into account? So these are case law quotes because we don't have statute. In essence, absolutely nothing must be left out of the determination, which means that when we talk to our clients about domicile, we work through a process that um, it's not so intrusive, but we need to know quite a lot about, about you so that we can reach a view on how strong your claim is. Um, you know, it, any, anything you do, anything you say, any part of your life can be taken into account. Second point, what is the interplay between intention and action? Um, you've got to have the right intentions. Um, that's the first point. But one, one thing I'd like to say is that intentions don't need to be held um, very long before you die that doesn't prevent you from being domiciled so i mean there's a very good us case about this so this bloke um in the in in the late 19th century um was taking his family i think it's across the tennessee kentucky border something like that so he he'd gone over the border because he wanted to move to think tennessee he bought a house and um, that was where he was going to settle, went back, loaded his 15 wives and 100 children onto one of these horses and carriages, moved everything over the border. This is a true story. By the end of the day, she'd murdered him. She didn't really want to do that. Um, but he'd done everything. He had the right intention and he had also um, really severed all of his ties and moved everything lock, stock and barrel. And he was held to have become domiciled in Tennessee, despite having only been physically present there for about six hours. Um, it's quite a funny case. Um, so intention can be if, can be inferred by what you do. So it isn't enough just to say you hold the right intentions. You have to show that by what you do. So that's that interplay between intention and action. And just living here for a long time isn't enough. Um, you have to hold the right intentions. Um, so you can have all the actions. It can look like a brilliant claim. But unless you have the intention, it doesn't work. There was another case in the 70s, uh, um, a cantankerous old British bloke. Um, he must have been cantankerous. He moved from um, the UK to Monaco, very wealthy man. Albert Claw uh, was his name. And he had the outward lookings of a fantastic claim. He ticked all the boxes. It was brilliant. Um, but the revenue weren't that sure, um, so they decided to in launch an investigation and literally everyone they spoke to who knew him, his friends and his family, said he didn't really like it. Um, he missed the UK. Um, so they obviously didn't like him very much because they, com they completely wrecked his planning. Um, so action on its own isn't enough, got to have intention. OK, so you can see the interplay. What evidence do we, do we, um, do we require? Well, look, I mean, think about it like this. Um, you won't be there to, to prove your case. So 100% of the value of an exercise and change your domicile is about arming your executives to not only have, but to win any dispute with HM Revenue and Customs. So you've got to tell people what your intentions are. You've got to write it down. Um, does the revenue blindly believe what you say? No, of course not. They look at action. Um, so it's again that, that interplay, but you've got to say, you've got to have it written down because otherwise no one will know. Um, so creating statements of domicile, making sure your wills are written to say, for example, I am domiciled in, the, in, in Singapore, super important. What you tell people is important, where you're buried is important. Actually, let's, let's go straight to factors. Oh, intention, yeah, we'll come to factors in a second. What, um, this question basically means, what if I have it and I lose it because I've changed my mind? Does that mean I didn't have it to start with? Well, no, it doesn't. If you have sincerely held the view that, for example, Singapore is going to be a permanent home and you've, you've built a great claim, but something happens because life throws curveballs and you leave, that doesn't mean you were never domiciled in Singapore. It just means your UK domicile revived from a certain point in time. Um, so that's important. So key points, so here are the factors, right. Um, the revenue will only comment on your death. So we've got to arm your executives. We, I do a lot of work with clients on this, um, providing formal views and assessments of domicile, working with clients to draw, to, to draw biographical statements, getting wills written. You know, where people invest with us, by the way, they get all of this for free, including the wills. Um, now, what are some of the things that we need to, to, to think about? Well, you know, as I said before, 
Um, there's no factor that shouldn't be taken into account. Um, but some of the, you know, the ones in red are very, very important. So what you intend for your remains, what you tell people where you administrate your, your estate from, et cetera, et cetera, very, very important. So I think that's all I want to say on the domicile of choice. Um, let's speed through, because I'm conscious of time, we want to have a good Q&A, so I'll try and get this done in the next five or six minutes. Um, so let's take Terry and June. Terry was domiciled in the UK. June was domiciled in Singapore. Terry passes away. And if you remember, that, there was that charge to tax. June has, in fact, the right within two years of Terry's death to elect to, to be British domiciled at the day that, um, that Terry died. So that means if she does that, then she gets all the assets tax free. That means that she's British domiciled. But if she stays non-resident for four tax years, UK tax years, she becomes Singaporean again. Um, so if you're in that mixed domicile marriage situation, there is a little bit of planning that you can do and the cost of that is just the cost of a postage stamp on a letter to the revenue domicile election. Um, foreign pension schemes, very simple this. Now, um, the revenue in 2011, actually the Treasury came up with um, a piece of statute law that created the framework that would allow non-UK pension schemes that meet certain pretty exacting conditions to be exempt from inheritance tax. UK pensions schemes are exempt from inheritance tax. So let's do the same for foreign schemes that they meet certain criteria. So you could, if you wanted to, just dump a whole pile of money into a foreign pension scheme, invest it and draw the income, and that would be free of inheritance tax. We've got to make sure you draw the pension. That's very important. You can't overfund and underdraw. So it has to be a real pension scheme. If you're residents in the UK, the pension scheme income is taxable, but it does create a very interesting um, inheritance tax free solution. Of course, that means that uh, you know it would provide a spouse pension and then when the spouse passes away, it can go to the children or, or, or other, other beneficiaries. There's a whole lot more I could say about the conditions, but foreign pension schemes certainly is an option. Business and agricultural relief. Um, so we, I talked before about giving something away without reservation of benefit and surviving at least seven years. Well, wouldn't it be great if you could buy something, keep it, enjoy it and only need to survive for two years? For it to become exempt from inheritance tax and you can they are assets that qualify for business and agricultural property relief in the uk um what does that mean it means interest in non-listed companies uh non-listed businesses so inherently slightly higher risk from an investment perspective but you know it can be an important part of planning there's a very evolving market for this in the UK and needless to say um but well, evolved market actually we, we do a lot of this work in the UK for our clients um so you're effectively investing for the next generation aren't you so you can perhaps afford to take a little bit of extra investment risk um but you know provided the conditions are met throughout the term after you've owned it for two years it becomes exempt from inheritance tax um this is a great one a loan trust so you if you can just track with me here, you loan money to a discretionary trust. That discretionary trust buys an investment. That investment generates a return. The return funds the loan repayment to you. So, for example, a million pounds in, making 5%, you can have 5% back per, per policy year. So at the end of the year, there's still a million pounds in, in, in the investment bond. All growth on that is exempt from inheritance tax. And as you receive the loan repayment and spend it as income, that is how you are saving inheritance tax. Um, so you, you, you're putting a million pounds into a trust uh, by, by way of a gift, a loan, sorry, a loan. Um, and the inheritance tax saving comes as you are spending the loan repayment as income. You're not using income tax allowances. It's a tax free return of capital, but you must spend it. In the meantime, the money's invested, growing, the growth is outside of your estate for inheritance tax purposes. Really, really terrific um, idea, that one. There's a very similar one called a discounted gift trust, and there's also a, a gift plan, that I, but I, I didn't want to go through too many of the trust-based solutions. We have to find the right one for you. Um, excluded property trust. So let's just say June, from our example, Singaporean, was going to move to the UK, uh, probably permanently. 
um, June is non-UK domicile at that point, and when she goes to the UK and lands with the intention of settling permanently, she becomes UK domiciled. So what she can do is take all of her non-UK assets while she's still in Singapore and put them into a property, and that makes them free of inheritance tax permanently, even after she becomes domiciled in the UK. So if you are in a mixed domicile marriage, the use of an excluded property trust, I think, carries it, it should certainly be worthy of consideration. A couple of other, other things um, before the best solution. So purchase life annuities. Um, you buy a right to income that dies with you. That's placing the capital that you spent on the purchase life annuity outside of your estate. But annuity rates are absolutely awful. So you probably, you know, we, we, I don't think we could really recommend it from a wealth planning perspective um, because, you know, we're not here to, to help you lose money. Um, but it is a good inheritance tax planning tool if, if you have sufficient capital. And finally, capital taxes treaties. So the UK has got about 10 of them. Um, and basically, it, this is really just for real estate. So I'll illustrate it with France. If you decide to buy a holiday home in France, that's exempt from UK inheritance tax under the treaty. It's liable in France and you get allowances in France. So you're, you're, you're making the use of two inheritance tax systems rather than it just being compounded as a 40 percent rate in France. And as you can see, there are some other countries there. I'm not so sure I'd like to buy a, a property in the Democratic Republic of Congo, but there you go. Um, and the last one, most importantly, do not forget to spend your money, um, please. Um, enjoy your retirement. Uh, there's lots of great things you can do with money, so let's not forget to spend it. So I'm going to leave us now with one last poll question. I'd be grateful if, um, if Helen could just share that. And then it's simply this, of the solutions you've heard, um, which ones appeal to you most right now? Giving assets away, protecting from inheritance tax through life policy, changing your domicile, assets that, that enjoy IHT exemption after two years, loan trust, um, didn't say about discounted gift trust, qualifying non-UK pension schemes, spending it. So I'll just give you a couple of moments to, um, to do that. No one can, your answers are anonymous. It's just uh, quite interesting um, for us all to see. Excellent. Perhaps we can get some. Uh, well, it's still coming in, aren't they? Brilliant. Well, perhaps we can flash up some answers there, um, Helen, so we can get on with the Q and A. Yeah, changing my domicile is the most most commonly talked about one. So, as I say, be be more than happy. It's so uh, I've practiced in domicile for for twenty years, so I'm more than happy to talk to you individually about that. So, fantastic. Thank you. So, what I'm now going to do is stop my screen share, so we can get on with the Q and A. Um, I believe you're there as well now, David. I oh, yeah, Martin. Thank you so so much indeed. I mean. Uh, an awful lot of content in uh, in that presentation as well. So we will make sure that the slides are distributed as well. Really, really thorough. Thank you so much. Nice so, I, thought, <laughs> I thought it was also also nice to see Victor Mildrew as well, and uh, and, and Margaret. Oh, yeah. And I was still trying to work out who the fluffy animal was as well. So thanks, <laughs> thanks for that. Um, so this is the opportunity for all of you to ask Martin any questions. Um, so if you if you do have any, um, please do um, either raise your virtual hand and I'll try and transport you. Um, or you can put some questions into the chat function. And again, you can anonymise those questions just in case there are any particular personal sensitivities that you would not wish to disclose too much. Um, but given that we've only got about nine minutes, Martin, and perhaps if, um, if the questions are a bit sort of slow coming, once we send out your slides to everybody, um, we'll, we'll make sure your contact details are there so that um, those on the call today will, uh, can be connected to Martin directly. Yeah, and in the follow-up email, of course, ask questions, yeah. Perfect. Um, I've got a couple, if I may, just to get things going. Um, mm. And you should have covered a little bit of it in your presentation, but when would you say the right time is to actually um, start inheritance tax planning? When yeah. is the right time to start doing it? I, I think it begins with awareness. Um, so we can't decide on the right time if, if we're not aware of what the extent of the, the issue is. Um, so look, uh, as I said, my personal view, and is subjective, is that whilst you're working, life assurance written in trust to protect against the unforeseen is probably the best thing. Because um, the other solutions involve giving things away or losing control because you're having a trust. Uh, and that may not be appropriate while you're growing well. Because, you, you know, what do you grow well for? You grow it for 
to create legacy, but also to provide for yourself in retirement. We've got to meet that aim. And we don't want to do anything that stops us or prejudices, prejudices our ability to meet that aim. So I think structured inheritance tax planning, so most of the solutions I mentioned before, typically are for you know, the years in run up to and into retirement. Um, uh, and perhaps life cover uh, du you know, during the working years. Of course, it depends on wealth. Um, you've got some very, very wealthy people who do need to plan very much earlier. Thank you. We've got a, we've got a question that's come in as well. Um, uh, we've got a couple of them That's brilliant. Keep them coming. Um, so Martin asks, um, out of the many UK expats dying overseas each year, in practice, how does uh, HMRC decide who to pursue to collect inheritance tax? That's a good question. That is a good question. Thanks, Martin. I'm glad you could join us. Um, well, I think um, I, we don't know. They don't publish stats on this. And why would they? Um, I, I think the way I'd answer the question is, is like this. If you're a British national and you die abroad, then, you know, the mothership back in the UK gets to find out because obviously that's going to be notified to, to the High Commission. Um, now, what use does HMRC make of that information? They don't publish that those stats. Um, but what we do know is that there is an ever increasing exchange of information between governments. Um, so, you know, if the revenue felt that felt that it was important to get a, a grasp on someone's offshore estate, they could do it. Uh, they have to have cause, I think. They can't just, you know, without legal authority, just go and interrogate government databases. Um, so I think, um, uh, you know, they, they, they they really don't publish data on this, but but you've got to assume that, that a certain amount of this stuff does go on. Of course, they have capacity constraints as well at the revenue. But, um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, got a couple of questions that are coming through directly. I have a feeling that maybe the the, the anonymity function isn't working on this. So if you do have some things, oh. first, please bring them through to me as well, and I'll I'll uh, I'll ensure you, you have my confidence in your um, in your. Uh, Keep, keeping those quiet and um, a couple have come through as well um is there a limit on the number of gifts one can make in one's lifetime oh uh, no short answer no um you can give anything amount uh, any any amount to anyone um and there's no tax on that um provided in most cases you survive by seven years okay great stuff thank you and it, what one that actually sort of I, I had a conversation around this sort of quite recently, so it's quite pertinent to me. So excuse me for taking the floor here, but it's a question that has come through, and it's how do you try and encourage parents and elder generations to take action? Um, I mean, this 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 is around sometimes having quite hard conversations within your family, and certainly for younger generations to try and trigger a you know a, a way that families can actually you know can can look at solutions to to support um, other generations as well. Have you have you got any ideas? Yeah, I love that question. I, do you know, I've never been asked that question before, um, but it is such a good one, such a relevant one. So, look, I mean, uh, in my experience, there's no one size fits all solution. It, it's a question of the quality of the relationship, isn't it? Um, but I, I think the way I would approach this um, with my parents would be to say, well, well, they know I'm a tax advisor. I've got that, that, that advantage. But I'd, I perhaps would say, well, look, you know, I've been doing some of my own planning. I'm writing my will. And what I'd like to do is make provision for you if I go before you. And, oh, um, you know, by the way, you, you know, if you've done your planning, um, would, would you like a conversation with a you know, with my tax advisor on a no names, you know, on a on a confidential basis. It is hard because no one really likes to think about death too much and the sadness that that brings. Um, so, you know, and it, it, but often we we don't ask the question because we're a bit nervous to and um, and. I think I would want, if it were my parents, all I would want to know is that they have done wills. I don't really, it's their money, fundamentally. Um, they may be daunted by it. They may um, be, be, be sort of a bit overwhelmed by the prospect of taking advice. Um, so, you know, they might say, say, I'm so glad you asked because oh, it's been bothered, it's been on my mind, but I don't know how to do it. Um, you know, so say so an offer of an introduction to who, whichever tax advice you use could could be an appropriate way of doing things, uh, but certainly you, you you know and just offer help. You know, 
make sure you got your wills drawn up. I'm happy to pay for it for you. Just want to make sure you have peace of mind about your planning. And by the way, I don't care what you're giving to me. It could be nothing as far as I'm concerned. Just, you know, I think that's kind of how I'd probably approach it. Thanks, Martin. Um, I've got a question here from from uh, from the audience, and I'm going to wrap it into a final question, uh, just conscious of time. So, um, you talked about a number of the solutions um, available to support inheritance tax planning and your presentation. Some, some really good sort of practical advice there as well. So, the first question is quite specific. Um, it's if you intend to change domicile but have not yet been accepted as a citizen or a PR by the local jurisdiction, does that affect the outcome of your domicile? So that's around the domicile piece. Is question one, and I guess to sort of the follow-up and the final question is have you seen a a is there a, is there a um are there more sort of um sort of positive solutions from your clients that you're seeing that uh, that, that you're working with at the moment are there yeah are there right. specific solutions that you know within your expertise your clients sort of typically end up doing yeah of course right let's start with the the, the first one um, there was a case in 1872, I have this line for numbers, funny enough, 1872, domicile case where a bloke had spent a lot of his time in Jamaica and he was thrown out, uh, he, he just became illegal, I think he committed some crime there, and he wasn't allowed to re-enter, but he loved the place and he counted it as his permanent home. Um, and that was sufficient for him to be judged as a domiciliary of that country. So what? So, so the application of that to the question is the following. Your, your ability to form the intention that a certain country will be your permanent home and to organise your life around that is not dependent upon a particular visa status, is particularly not dependent on taking nationality there. British people can become domiciled in Singapore. Um, you don't need to have PR. You don't even need to be on an EP. You could, you could be based in JB, but spending time here because you love it here, that works. Um, but of course, there's a very practical thing, isn't there? Um, you know, if you can't stay here, you have to leave. And that does change the dynamics. So now I accept that. I mean, most people who successfully take domicile in Singapore uh, and retire here, by definition, they have to do that. Usually they will change, change nationality, but it's not a requirement. So um, I wouldn't let um, a visa status put you off um, uh, building the claim, um, but eventually, if, if you can't, if your tenure here does come to an end, you need to have that plan B that I talked about, which, which kind of segues into your second question, David. So, look, I, mean, I think um, gifting is always a good discussion to have with clients. Um, it's quite nice to think about giving money away and making other people happy. Um, but I think it you know, the best solutions are the, are the solutions that blend inheritance tax planning with income and capital gains tax planning. So when, if you go back to the UK, you're drawing a tax efficient income from an inheritance tax efficient structure. So, so I, I think, you know, most of the time, a lot of the time, we tend to find that the loan trust I mentioned has, um, has a place. I mean, you know, you don't load all of our eggs into one basket. Um, so, you know, quite often we see domicile as a plan A and loan trust as plan B. Um, so, you know, and they're very, very cheap. You know, the, the, loan, the loan trust arrangements themselves don't carry a cost. I mean, the investment management that underlies that does, um, but, but the actual documentation, the creation and the management of the trust doesn't. So, for, you know, lots, lots of our clients, um, you know, are interested in that particularly. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, look, thank you so much, Martin. We really appreciate your time today. And of course, all of you who joined us in the audience, thanks also for your questions as well. Um, like I said, um, you know, select investors, you know, our big supporters of the chamber. We'll make sure that you get a copy of, of the slides. Today. A lot of really brilliant content on to that. So um, thank you, Martin and select investors for, for your continued thank support. Great. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Um, it would be remiss of me uh, not to let you know about the Chamber's fantastic webinars coming up. And there are um, a, a sort of two in particular. Um, we've got a, a healthcare and health tech trade webinar coming up next week, which is looking really, really positive. Um, this is part of our um, programme to um, uh, you know, enhance partnerships between Singapore and the UK and look at, look at key areas, which is great. Um, we've got a green bonds and carbon offsetting and the challenges with data transparency conference coming up later in July as well. Um, and also, um, we're sort of very, very conscious that um, lots of us aren't able to travel home to see our families over 
uh, over, over the summer period. So we are doing some more community and some more sort of lifestyle events as well to keep people connected. And we've got a, a Life After Rugby webinar series, which is, which is looking really, really good. So thank you again for joining us. You'll receive a feedback form. Please do fill that in. It really helps um, the Chamber to understand what you'd like to hear more of and how you found today's session. So that leaves me to say a final thank you from myself and the Chamber. And we very much look forward to welcoming you to an event soon. Um, have a good rest of the day and take care.